Well, good morning. Praise God for another day and another opportunity to worship Him. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we will open up to where we left off on last night, in the book of Ephesians. We're going to look today at Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6. Today we address the issue of a man's leadership in his home, his leadership of his family. This is a crucial topic, for in fact, a man's leadership in his home is pivotal not only to the church, but also to the state. It was Manton who said that the home is the seminary of both the church and the state. The home is the place where leaders for the church are forged. In fact, a man is to be examined for leadership in the church by first looking at his track record of leadership in his home. It is a man's leadership in his family that is foundational to determining whether or not he is even qualified for leadership among God's people. This is crucial. It is also the home that is the place where citizens are forged for the state. The state has no charge, no responsibility, or no jurisdiction over children, informing them as future citizens. It is the home that is charged with this duty, with this responsibility. It is the home that forges the character of future leaders in the state where we learn to follow and where we learn to lead. So it is absolutely critical that we look here in Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 and see what it actually means for a man to lead in his home. First, listen to this from James Alexander speaking about the issue of a man and his leadership in his home. He is their head. He is such by a divine and unalterable constitution. These are duties and prerogatives which he cannot alienate. It, alienate. There is something more than mere precedence in age, knowledge, or substance. He is the father and the master. No act of his and nothing in his character can fail to leave a mark on those around him. A man is the head, master, and leader of his home. And there's nothing he can do about that. He will either lead effectively or he will lead poorly, but he will lead. A man's failing to lead is actually a man leading in failure. This is not optional. There are, however, objections to the idea of a man leading in his home. There are those objections, of course, that we would not be surprised by in the culture at large. We know that the feminist movement has huge problems with what I've just said, the idea that the man is the head of his household, that the man is the leader in his family. Ari Hoikeman, a leader in the United Nations Population Fund, has in fact referred to the breakdown in the family in the West as a triumph. It's a good thing, he argues. Why? Why would a man say something like this? Ari Hoikeman actually argues that high divorce rates, high out-of-wedlock birth rates actually signal a triumph of human rights over patriarchy. In other words, male headship in the home is oppressive, and divorce and out-of-wedlock birth rates represent liberation from that oppression. Uh, again, it, 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 it's almost unfathomable that anyone would say such a thing, let alone a leader of the United Nations. But if you're troubled by that, you don't know much about the United Nations. All right. Um, <laughs> did that, I said that out loud, didn't I? Okay, my bad. Other radical feminists feel the same way. Linda Gordon, for example. Listen, listen to this statement. The nuclear family must be destroyed, and people must find better ways of living together. Whatever its ultimate meaning, the breakup of families now is an objectively revolutionary process. 
No woman should have to deny herself any opportunities because of her special responsibilities to her children. Families will be finally destroyed only when a revolutionary social and economic organization permits people's needs for love and security to be met in ways that do not impose divisions of labor or any external roles at all. That's radical. But wait, there's more. Andrea Dworkin. Under patriarchy, no woman is safe to live her life or to love or to mother children. Under patriarchy or male headship, every woman is a victim, past, present, and future. Under patriarchy, every woman's son is her potential betrayer and also the inevitable rapist or exploiter of another woman. That's our cultural context. But you say, yeah, but that's, that's out there. Certainly, that's the radical feminist people who don't even claim to know God. But there are also objections in here. Evangelical feminism, as it is euphemistically called, has objections to the idea of male leadership and male headship in the home. There are three basic objections, and we have to deal with these before we move forward with this text here in Ephesians chapter 5. And the reason that we have to deal with these is quite simple, because they have gained much headway in the church. And there are many in the church, even in churches that you would consider, you know, run-of-the-mill conservative evangelical churches, some of these ideas have crept in and have become assumed. For many of you as students, you assume some or all of this about the idea of male headship, that somehow it's an archaic concept, that somehow it's anachronistic for us to talk about men as heads of their household and to look at passages like Ephesians chapter 5 in that context. Three main arguments, I'll give them to you and then we'll address them in turn. One, the culture two, the curse, and three, the confusion. Those are the three arguments. The first argument is the culture, that Paul's admonition to male headship in Ephesians chapter 5, and they have to deal with Ephesians chapter 5, by the way. You, there's just no way around it. You cannot assault this idea of male headship in the home without somehow dealing with Ephesians chapter 5. So evangelical feminism deals with Ephesians chapter 5, and the first line of argumentation is this is cultural, that Paul here in Ephesians chapter 5 is merely making a cultural statement because of circumstances on the ground, as it were. Now the problem with this argument is that the Bible teaches male headship in the home in a number of places, not only Ephesians 5, but also Colossians 3 and 1 Peter 3, as well as Titus 2 and 5. All of these places we see men called to lead as heads of their household and women called to submit to the leadership of their husbands. But more importantly and more foundational to this is the teaching in Genesis chapters 1 through 3 which solidify the idea of male headship. So there is no way that what Paul teaches in Ephesians chapter 5 is merely some cultural accommodation that calls for male headship in this particular setting and circumstance and does not see male headship as the norm. This for example does not take into consideration Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where he says the head of the woman is the man, the head of every man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. We also see in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that Paul roots male headship in the creation order. Not only do we see that argument, but also the argument of the curse, that actually what we're dealing with here is male headship as a result of the curse. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, when God looks at Eve, or looks at the woman before she was named Eve, and says that because of what she's done, the consequence will be 
that her desire will be for her husband, but he will rule over you. That, that's the idea. That when God says that in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, you have male headship established as a byproduct of the curse. Listen to this. Her curse now was to be ruled perversely, to long for her husband and he to rule over her. She would want to be dominated by her husband, and he would submit to this desire. God does not command Adam to rule or govern his wife. Rather, the curse is Eve's. The ruling is a consequence of Eve's longing and her fall. That's the argument from evangelical feminism, that this is a product of the fall. Now, there are a couple of problems with this. If this is a product of the fall, my first question is, why do we find in Ephesians 5, in Colossians 3, in Titus 2, this same allusion to male headship referring to people who are in Christ, who have been redeemed from the curse, if it's just a product of the fall? Here's my second question to those who would argue that male headship is a product of the fall. My second question is this, have you been in the delivery room with a Christian woman giving birth? You go, what does that have to do with anything? Well, okay, think about this. Male headship is a product of the fall. Therefore, when we are in Christ, that curse is removed and we no longer have male headship. But God also said to Eve, there would be much pain in her childbearing. So if, logically, becoming a Christian removes the curse, there ought to be screaming in the delivery room of non-believers and peace and calm in the delivery room of believers. I know better. I was there. I have heard the famous, you did this to me. <laughs> I have watched the woman whom I love with every fiber of my being turn into a creature who looked at me with eyes that said, if you come too close, I will kill you. <laughs> Now wipe my forehead. <laughs> the other problem here is that we see male headship before the fall. We see male headship, for example, in Genesis chapter 2. The woman was made after the man, male headship. The woman was made for the man. I will make him a helper suitable for him, male headship. The woman was made from the man, male headship. The woman was brought to the man, male headship. And the woman was named by the man, male headship. And if that's not enough for you, all you have to do is go later on in chapter 3 when Adam receives his curse, and God says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Because you did not exercise your headship. If that's not enough for you, just go to Romans chapter 5, where Paul doesn't say, because of the sin of one couple, Adam and Eve, death into the world. No, because of the sin of one man. Adam. Jesus is not referred to as the last Adam and Eve. He's referred to as the last Adam. Why? Male headship. So what's happening there in Genesis 3.16 with the curse? Well, I'm glad you asked. God says your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Now, unfortunately, our evangelical feminist author here completely misses 
the nuance of that text. She says that somehow the woman is going to be pining for her husband. If you just go to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, you see the identical phrase. God says to Cain in Genesis 4, 7, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. God is not saying to Cain, sin is yearning and pining for you. Oh, it loves you. No. He is saying sin's desire is to overtake you, and you must rule over it. See, the curse is not male headship. The curse is the woman's natural rebellion to the headship of the man. That's the curse. Your desire will be to usurp your husband's authority, and yet his authority will not be removed. And because of this desire, there should be a clash between you and your husband. But in this clash, creation order will not be overturned. He will rule over you. That's the nuance there in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. Male headship is not invented in Genesis chapter 3. It is reinforced in Genesis chapter 3. But the clash against male headship is what we see as a product of the fall. There is a third argument, and that is the argument of the confusion, that we have completely and utterly misinterpreted this passage here in Ephesians chapter 5, because we have forgotten verse 21. If you look with me there in Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 21. And it reads, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So here's the argument. And you find this even in just very conservative circles. The argument is that because of verse 21, what we have is the idea of mutual submission between husband and wife. We don't have the idea of male headship, male leadership within the context and confines of the home, but we have the idea of mutual submission of believers to one another. And they just have sort of different roles within this mutual submission, but the submission is mutual. That's the argument, that we've completely mistaken what Paul meant to say because we have not paid close enough attention to verse 21 in our assertion of male headship. Um, First, let me give you my technical theological response, and then we'll look at this exegetically. My technical theological response to that assertion is not. But let's do a little exegetical work here, shall we? Couple of problems. One problem is the verb that is used here. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ in verse 21. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Now, that verb there in verse 22 is the verb carried over from verse 21, basically says wives to husbands. And the verb there is hupotasso. So it's actually a military term. And this military term refers to the voluntary submission of an inferior officer to a superior officer or to a soldier or of a soldier to a superior officer. That's what the verb means. It, It means that you submit to someone because of their rank. You submit to them because of the office that they hold. The problem with the idea of mutual submission is that it doesn't work with this verb. There is no mutual submission in military ranks. The captain does not come to the private and say, Private, there are some things that I'd really like to discuss with you. I really think we need to take that hill over there. But I know we're called to submit to one another mutually, so I'd really like to discuss with you, Private, whether or not you feel like charging that hill over there as we mutually submit to one another. 
private, then coming back and saying, Captain, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you honoring this mutual submission agreement that we have to one another. Um, there's a machine gun up there, and um, I just really think m maybe, no. <laughs> Not the way the military works. How does the military work? Superior officer gives order. Inferior salutes and executes. That's how the military works. It is not mutual submission. And that's the term. The term does not allow for the mutual submission interpretation. There is another problem. The second problem is that this mutual submission clause, supposed mutual submission clause in Ephesians 5.21, does not exist in Colossians 3, does not exist in 1 Peter 3, does not exist in Titus 2. So elsewhere where we have the headship of the husband and the submission of the wife, we do not have this mutual submission clause. So here's what evangelical feminism argues. You don't take all of these texts together and read them the way they normally read in all of their senses, you take this one text that has what appears to be a mutual submission clause, and you then superimpose that clause on your reading of all the other texts. That's the argument. Doesn't work that way hermeneutically in anything else that we do. But in this particular instance, that's what we're supposed to do. There is a third problem, and it's the immediate context, broader context problem. In order for us to understand this, and we're going to get to Ephesians chapter 5 and male headship, but trust me, this is necessary. The third problem is when you go back to this text and put it in context, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21 is the end of a paragraph. I don't know about you, but generally when I start reading something, I go to the beginning of paragraphs, not the end. Maybe you do that. Me, I go to the beginning of the paragraph. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 is the end of a paragraph that begins in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. When we get there, here's what we find. Very interesting. We have three commands. On the third command, you get... Uh, excuse me. Go to verse 15 with me. Three contrasts. I'm sorry. Like, why is that not what I'm talking about? We get three contrasts. On the third, <laughs> I'm sorry. Just had a senior moment there. We have, we have three contrasts. On the third contrast, you get three commands, and on the third command, you get three contexts. All right. Look at the beginning of verse 15. Let's look at these three contrasts. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. So there's a contrast. Not unwise, but wise. The second one, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. There's the second contrast. First one, not unwise, but wise. The second one, not foolish, but understanding the will of the Lord. Here's the third contrast. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. There's the third contrast. On the third contrast, you get three commands. Three commands as to how to fill the third contrast. Look at verse 19. First, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. There's the first command. The first command related to what? The third contrast. It's how you live that spirit-filled life. What's the second command? Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's your second command. Created, correlated to what? That third contrast. Here's how you do it. This is the spirit-filled life. And then there's the third command. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the third command as it relates to the contrast of the spirit-filled life versus drunk with wine. On the third command, you get three contexts. What are they? Wives to husband. 
5.24 to the end of the chapter. Children to parents, 6.1 through 4. Slaves to masters, 6.5 through 9. In other words, Ephesians 5.21 is not the umbrella over the rest of Ephesians chapter 5. It's actually the umbrella over Ephesians 5.22 through 6.9. And here's why that's important. Because in all of those relationships, the husband-wife relationship, the verb used there is not a mutual submission verb. In the parent-child relationship, not mutual submission. Children are called to hearken to the voice of their parents. Parents are not called to submit to their children. And in the third one, slaves and masters. Masters are not called to submit to their slaves. Slaves are called to submit to their masters. So in each one of these contexts, submission works in one direction. There is a person who is the head, and there is a person who's called to submit to the one who is the head. Therefore, because of all of these things, the idea that we've misunderstood Paul's teaching here about the husband and his headship in his home is not an acceptable explanation for the text. Instead, what we get is Paul is very clear and unambiguous, and the husband is to exercise headship in his household. Now here we have the household codes. Whenever you see the household codes, for example, if we go to Colossians chapter 1, or if we go to 1 Peter chapter 3, or if we go to Titus chapter 2, always either right before or right after, you have husband and wife, you have children and parents, and you have slaves and masters. These are household codes. So the first thing we see about a man's leadership in his household is this, that a man's leadership in his household goes to his government of all the affairs of his home. A man's leadership in his household goes to the government of all the affairs in his home. First, yes, there is the idea of a man and his headship and his leadership with his wife. Unfortunately for many of us, that's sort of where we stop. The whole thing is about, who, is, is the man the head of his marriage? Yeah, the man's the head of his marriage, but please don't stop there. The man is also the head of his household as it relates to the training and discipleship of his children, which means men cannot and must not abdicate when it comes to the training and discipleship of their children. Here's the great irony. The great irony is we have men who want to stand up and pound their chest. Yes, the Bible says, I am the head. I am the head of my marriage. So when my wife and I have a disagreement, I have the last word. Hurrah. Good for you. Let me ask you this. Are you the chief and principal discipler of your children? Well, see, well, see when my wife and I, when, 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 we, when, we're, when, when we're trying to, I, I'm, I'm the boss of her. <laughs> Have you laid a roadmap for how your children Learn to believe the right things in order that they might be transformed by the gospel. Yeah, but see, you, but see the, yeah, the, the Bible says that my wife, she's supposed to, see, that's where we want to end. But the text says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Does this mean that my wife doesn't have a role to play in the discipleship of my children? No. Any more than it means that my wife doesn't have a role to play in any of the other aspects of our family life. But the idea here is that I am to exercise headship when it comes to the discipleship of my children. We have lost this. We have missed this. And let me say a word in particular to those of you who are considering the ministry. There has been an idea in generations past. You take care of God's business and he'll take care of your family. This same idea is the idea that has allowed evangelists to be world renowned while they spend three, four, five, six months at a time away from their families in the name of serving the Lord. 
This attitude has been the excuse for pastors who devote their lives to taking care of the problems in everyone else's household while they neglect their family so commonly that we have a phrase called the PK, which refers to these neglected, untrained, undisciplined, undiscipled children who grew up in pastors' households but were not discipled there. And it's sin, pure and simple. My first calling, my first ministry is to be Bridget's husband. And Jasmine, Trey, Elijah, Asher, Judah, Micah, and Safia's father. Yep, this many. <laughs> That's my job. Go and make disciples of Pantata Ethne, every people group. We love that Great Commission, don't we? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've taught you. Let me ask you this. How dare I do that out there and not do it at home? How dare I disciple your children and fail to disciple mine? That is my duty as a father. This last one we're uncomfortable with. This idea of a father and his headship in the context of a slave-master relationship. Let me explain this to you. And this one, it used to be difficult for me as well. There's a family in our church who got an opportunity to move to the Middle East. And there in the Middle East, this individual was a pilot. He was recruited by an airline over in the Middle East. There in the country where they live, it is common for households to have servants. In fact, that you, you can't find a place to, to, to rent there that doesn't have servants' quarters attached. It is just absolutely common. It's the air they breathe. It's the way things are. Well, he's there for a little while, and, you know, we, we're, we're Skyping. We're keeping up with one another. And um, I have had two opportunities now to go and, and visit with them there in the Middle East and to preach there, and it's been incredible. But here's what began to happen. I began to get these messages from him, and we began to talk on Skype about the incredible things that were going on with their maid, their servant. This woman from another country who is in that Middle Eastern country, basically to serve as a servant, as a housemaid. The airline that hired him pays him a salary, also pays for them to have a housemaid. And some incredible things began to happen. like they began to invite their maid and her husband into their household with them for family worship every day. And as a result of it, this Sri Lankan maid and her husband were converted. Not only was this Sri Lankan maid and her husband converted, but other Sri Lankan maids began to hear about the relationship that this woman had with her master, as they call them, and would just sort of show up around the house from time to time. <laughs> and when they showed up around the house, they would be invited to join the family in family worship. And so, long story short, my first trip to go visit them in the Middle East, first opportunity to go and preach there, and number, I had the privilege of going out into the ocean in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates. Here's the Burj Dubai. You know that huge hotel that looks like the sail of a boat? I'm standing in the shadow of a Burj Dubai. There's Muslims everywhere. Not everywhere, everywhere. That's beyond everywhere, all right? <laughs> They're at the beach with the hijab on, the whole nine yards, and I walk out into the ocean baptizing Sri Lankan maids and butlers. Can I just tell you the truth real quick? I was scared. <laughs> Six people are going to drown me. <laughs> what an incredible testimony as people came over to ask, what's going on? 
the household codes. A man shepherding his wife, his children, and his servants. And God blessing the work. Male leadership in the home is comprehensive. You're responsible to set the trajectory for your entire household. In the time that we have, let me say this, because I want this to be clear. Male headship in the home is not something that is achieved through domination. It's something that requires submission. In fact, look with me beginning in verse 24. Verse 22, I'm sorry. Notice he doesn't say, husbands make your wives submit. He says in verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. This is not something that's forced on a wife. This is why I say to young men, if you find a young woman that you're interested in and she is unsubmissive, run. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Get out now. By the way, when I say she's unsubmissive, I don't mean she's submissive to you. Because she's not called to be submissive to you. I get that sometimes too. You know, my girlfriend, she's not really submissive to me. My response to that complaint is always, good for her. <laughs> yeah, but she's supposed to be submissive, right? Yeah, to her husband. Put a ring on her finger? Have you married her yet? Then she must not submit to you. <laughs> well, wait a minute. If she's not supposed to submit to me until I'm her husband, then how will I know if she's submissive? Watch her with her father. Why? Because that's the only context wherein she is now commanded to submit to male headship. Yeah, but you don't know her father's relationship with her. I don't care. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, they're just like special mitigating circumstances, really, because I don't care. Because a daughter's submission to her father is not based on her father's worthiness, it's based on God's command. Now, here's what I want to ask you, sir. What makes you think that this woman will find an excuse not to submit to the man who gave her birth and shelter and food, but somehow you're going to be so fine that she'll just gladly submit to you? <laughs> You better wake up. <laughs> if she doesn't submit to her father because her father is flawed, then she will not submit to you because you too, sir, are flawed. And if you marry an unsubmissive woman, you're in a world of hurt. How are you, what are you going to do? Are you going to arm wrestle her for leadership in your home? The next context, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Children are called and commanded to submit to their parents. They're commanded to. It is God who calls this. When it comes to slaves and their masters, go down to verse Five, slaves obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. So in each of these contexts, God does not say, sir, you are the head of your household. You must rule with an iron fist and force everyone in your home to bow the knee to you. Absolutely not. The idea is they, that, that they submit to you out of reverence for God. So if someone is not submitting to you within the context of your household, first thing we need to know, this is universal, your headship in your household. Secondly, it requires submission from those under your leadership, but how do they achieve that? By you shepherding them. 
That's how. By you shepherding them. What do you do with your wife? Go back to 525. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. When men come to me and say, oh, my wife has a submission problem, okay, fine. She has a submission problem and she has to deal with that before God, but let me ask you a question. Are you discipling her? Is she being washed with the water of the word? Are you bringing the truths of God's word to bear in her life? so that she is being built up and sanctified in him. Are you living with her, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 7, in an understanding manner, as with a weaker vessel? Are you praying for her? Are you falling on your face before a holy God, begging him to sanctify your wife? Or are you merely pointing your finger at her saying, you are not submitting? With your children, how do you get them there? Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Are you discipling your children? Is your discipline designed to bring them to the cross or merely to outward obedience? With your servants, look at verse 9. Masters, do the same to them. Stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is, ne- there is no partiality with him. Are you conducting yourself as a follower of Jesus Christ and bringing God's word to bear in all the relationships within the context and confines of your home that the result might be that your discipleship would bear fruit in the lives of everyone over whom God has given you charge? And how different is this from me man, you woman, me speak, you do. (laughs) This is the picture of biblical leadership in the context and confines of the home. This is what it means for a man to lead in his household. There's a final piece here. And the final piece here goes back to what we spoke about on last night. Remember, this is all about what? Christ, his body, and its unity. The glory of Christ manifested in his body, the church, and in its unity. That's what we see in the indicative half of the book of Ephesians, those first three chapters. Now we get to the imperative half of the book of Ephesians, these last three chapters. And remember, these imperatives, we have the ability to accomplish these imperatives because of what Christ has done in us. We've seen that in the first three chapters. And we are motivated to accomplish these imperatives. Why? Because of our desire as followers of Christ to see his glory manifested and magnified in those places where he has given us dominion. So what's your desire? What's my desire when it comes to my wife and my headship being exercised there? Here it is. My relationship with my wife is a living, breathing illustration of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church. I desire to exercise biblical Christ-honoring headship in my marriage because it is a picture of Christ And for me not to exercise that kind of headship in my marriage is a blasphemous act against my Lord and Savior and Master Jesus Christ. My desire for my wife to submit to me is not just so that I can feel powerful. 
but my desire is centered around the fact that she is called to submit to me as to Christ, that her submission to me is actually an act of worship toward Christ. So a wife who is not submissive to her husband has a worship disorder first and foremost. My headship with my wife centers around my desire for her to be sanctified and built up as a member of Christ's body. But not only is she a member of Christ's body, she's a member of my body in this mysterious one flesh union. I don't know who first said it to me, but I, I, it just, it, it's, I, I keep it in my mind. She's not just mine, she's me. She's not just mine, she's me. She is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So my desire is to see her built up because she's a member of the body of Christ and I desire his body to be built up and for him to fill all things. My desire for our unity has to do with the fact that she's a member of my body as well. We are one flesh. She's not just mine, she's me. Also, this picture that we paint of the relationship between Christ and his church has an impact first and foremost on our children who see this on a daily basis, but secondly, on our servants who also see this on a daily basis. So there is this picture of the truth of the gospel that we proclaim that is being lived out in the context of this marriage relationship. It does not replace the gospel, it is not the gospel, but it reinforces the message of the gospel. That changes my focus. That changes my everything. When a man comes to me and says, I, I'm finished, I can't do it anymore, I'm leaving. Where are you going, sir? You can't do that. Yes, I can, no you can't, you're her head. Head can't leave the body. You don't want her running around headless? Well, I, 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 well, I, I don't understand all that, I'm just leaving. No, you can't leave, where are you going? Go love your wife. You're commanded to love your wife. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. My desire for my children is what? That my children would come to know Christ. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. What is my desire with my children? That they would make me proud and become doctors and lawyers and quarterbacks and whatever. <laughs> but my desire for my children is that they walk with God. My desire first and foremost is that they would be saved. My desire is that they would know Christ, and that desire must lead all other desires. Everything else must take a back seat to that. Why? First half of the book, Christ, his body, and the unity thereof. I want my children to be part of the body of Christ. I want my children to be redeemed. I want Christ to be glorified as my children come to faith in him. I want the Father to be glorified as the Son gives my children to Him as a gift that is then reciprocated because the Father first entrusted them to Him. And I know that this happens through the proclamation of the gospel. So I preach the gospel to my children again and again and again. And my desire for their obedience to my headship has to do with them knowing Christ, not with impressing you. I want their hearts. I want them saved. God may there also made an argument that I've just never been able to get away from. And he says, as you look at your children, remember that that sin nature from which they need to be delivered was inherited from Adam through you. You gave it to them. Rid them of it if you can. They suffer under the curse. 
directly through you. Do everything that you can to deliver them from that. Oh, how many parents have fallen on their face before God, praying that their child would get into the right school, but have not spent one hour begging God that their child might get into heaven. I want my children saved, first and foremost. And so my headship and my leadership in my home as it relates to my children must center around this desire above and before all else, that they might know Christ in the pardon of their sins. This is real headship. Why is this important? Why is it important that we know the opposition that is out there? Why is it important that we fight for this ground? Here's why it's important that we fight for this ground. First and foremost, it's important that we fight for this ground because people are not just arguing against us, they're arguing against God. I don't write the mail, I just deliver it. And it is important that we refute those who contradict sound doctrine, Titus 1.9. That is my job, to refute those who contradict sound doctrine. Here's the second reason that this is important. If the picture of male headship in the home is an illustration of the relationship between Christ and his church, then anything that would mar that image is actually working to profane the truth about Christ. We can't have that. Here's the other problem. God has designed marriage to function in a way that brings glory to his name and that fulfills his design. And that design centers around male headship. If we undermine this fundamental truth, we begin to undo all. And so what do we see? We see marriages that are shipwrecked because of a failure to understand this issue. We see wives that wrestle with and run away from submission to their husbands, listening to and sounding more like the feminists. We see men who have no idea whatsoever what real headship is, which results in either passivity in men where they completely fade to the background or hyper-masculinity in men where they turn into Rambo. neither of which is acceptable. The idea is for biblical male headship. A man who understands his role, doesn't back down from his role, doesn't apologize for his role, and is terrified because he understands the magnitude of his responsibility. That's the picture. Now you go and do likewise. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have not left us to wander aimlessly in the dark. But has spoken clearly to the most pertinent issues in our lives and to our deepest needs. Grant that we might hear and heed your truth. For Christ's sake, for his glory, for his honor. Amen.